to you. Uh, one of my favorite tastes is the taste of the first orange I eat at the beginning of winter. Uh, the citrus is out. I generally haven't had an orange for months, and uh, there's just something about that first orange that's bursting with flavor. I also like the taste of uh, fresh picked blackberries in Oregon, only in Oregon. Uh, I like the taste of French roast coffee first thing in the morning. I like the taste of well-smoked ribs. Uh, I think peanut butter and jelly with a cold glass of milk at the right time. That's a classic taste of humanity, I think. Now, God is good, and taste is the way that David speaks of the goodness of God. Taste and see that the Lord is good, David says in Psalm 34. It's an invitation to experience the goodness of God. Because to taste something, you have to put it in your mouth. Uh, you, you, you can't just look and hold and smell something uh, to really know what it tastes like. You, you have to internalize it. Uh, to, to taste something takes a certain commitment. It has to be experienced. You don't know what goat cheese tastes like until you taste it. When David said, taste and see that the Lord is good, it was like he was saying, try the Lord. Take him for a test drive. If you're unconvinced, live by trusting him for a 30-day free trial, and then see what happens. In Psalm 34, David gives a personal testimony of God's goodness in his own life. And the interesting thing is that David doesn't say that God made everything perfect for him, so God is good. No. David had fears, but he says the Lord delivered him from all his fears. David said he had troubles in his life, but the Lord heard him when he called to the Lord and saved him out of all his troubles. David didn't claim that the Lord was good because his life was all smooth and trouble-free. No, he says it was in his fears, it was in his troubles, it was in his afflictions that David came to know God is good. That God is good is a common refrain throughout the Psalms. Psalm 106, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. Psalm 25, good and upright is the Lord. Psalm 86, for you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call upon you. De uh, Peter writes in his first letter to the believers he's writing to, he says you, that they have tasted, he says, you've tasted the goodness of the Lord. Jesus was setting out on a journey one day. And a man ran up to him, and he knelt before Jesus with great reverence. And he asked Jesus, he says, first he says, good teacher. And then he says, what, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus answered, why do you call me good? No one is good, but God alone. Maybe many people wonder, well, why did Jesus answer that way? I mean, isn't Jesus good? In Judaism at that time, a rabbi, you see, would never be addressed as good teacher because good was taught as a quality that belonged to God alone. And in a religious context, to call yourself good was to put yourself in danger of, of being blasphemous because, as Jesus affirmed, only God can be called good. And so it was then in that culture, in a religious context. And maybe Jesus was possibly being a little ironic with his uh, response and kind of subtly suggesting to this man, well, you need to figure out if you think I'm God or not. But then Jesus is also possibly pointing this young man away from himself, pointing him to God the Father, because the Son of God didn't think any more of his own goodness than an honest person thinks of her honesty. It's just so natural, it's like breath. Uh, 
You don't consciously focus on it. Jesus was a servant. He was humble. He only did and taught what the Father showed him. He didn't want to supersede the relationship he had with the Father. And so Jesus says, no one is good but God alone. But the point I want us to get is that Jesus affirms that God is good. It is an attribute of God. But you know, it can be hard to affirm that God is good. Because for many people, fears and troubles and problems convince them that God is not good. Or some say he doesn't even exist. We look around this world and we do see a lot of cruelty. We see brutality and we see evil and we suffer ourselves. And we wonder why, if God is good, why does he let this happen? How can there be a God who's good? There's so much bad. There's a book called Good God, Lousy World, and Me. Good God. Lousy World and Me. It's written by the human rights activist and lawyer. Her name is Holly Burkhalter. I don't think you've heard of her. But in it, she writes this. She says, I once heard it said, you can believe in an all-powerful, loving God, or you can believe in the Holocaust. But you can't believe in both those things. Yes, when I think of the Holocaust and all the other atrocities that have become horrifyingly ordinary, it seems just stupid to imagine a good God who put this in motion and only watches it unfold. God appears to be either uninterested or helpless against the forces of violence and cruelty that clearly have the upper hand most of the time, especially if you're a woman, a child, disabled, or you're poor. Holly Burkholzer said, it's less painful to believe that God doesn't exist at all than try to add it all up if there's a loving God when certainly daily it doesn't look like there is. And she's right. It can be really hard to hold that God is good in the face of so much wrong. I know about Holly Burkholzer because I met her in Washington, D.C. several years ago. Uh, at the invitation, I had come to Washington, D.C. Uh, at the invitation of an organization called International Justice Mission. IJM is one of the largest and most effective anti trafficking organizations in the world. They are also thoroughly Christian. And IJM specializes in combating the sex slave industry. It's just rampant in this world. Um, I was invited. To to go because I was part of their lobby day on Capitol Hill, where they uh, take one day to visit all the different leaders. And um, there was a piece of legislation that they were hoping to get passed. It was coming before the House of Representatives called the End Modern Slavery Initiative. And this bill provided billions of dollars to fight human trafficking throughout the world. I was invited by IJM to come and meet with our senator, Utah Senator Mike Lee, because he was one of two senators who put a hold on the bill. And they wanted a Christian leader from Utah to come and meet with him. Yeah, like I know how to do that, right? It was a fascinating meeting, and it's a story for another time, okay? Uh, but Holly Burkhalter was there when we met Senator Lee in his office, and Burkhalter is a Christian, but she wasn't always a Christian. She was an atheist for 40 years. She was deeply critical of Christianity. She'd been around the world. She'd seen the savagery. She'd seen the suffering of so many. She had seen so many atrocities, terrible, terrible things, that she just figured God probably didn't exist. And if he does exist, he's not good, and I don't want to have anything to do with him. But as she traveled and she did her human rights work, she kept coming into contact with Christians who were doing tremendous works of good in the midst of some of the worst stuff this world can have. She met a woman named Margaret from Uganda whose leg had been torn off when she stepped on a landmine when she was running from a Ugandan terrorist group called the Lord's Resistance Army. And Margaret had been brought to Washington to speak at a secular conference 
to human rights activists who were, and it was a conference on banning landmines. And despite an infection in her leg, which caused tremendous suffering, Margaret, in that speech before the secular group, thanked God for what had happened to her because she said she had experienced Jesus' presence much more after her injury, that she was blessed with the love of friends, and that she now could do the good work of helping others who were survivors of landmine accidents. And that made Holly Burkhalter just squirm when she heard that. <laughs> she said at the time, she stubbornly refused to find God in her blessings when so many others didn't have blessings. In other words, she felt guilty about having joy if other people don't have joy. And then someone pointed out to her, excuse me, that rejecting joy to stand with those who are suffering doesn't help the suffering. Who's that helping? Rather, it's those who bravely focus on what is good and beautiful and true, even in the small things, who give thanks and find joy in hardship. They are the change agents who bring the fullest light into the world. Well then, and then Burkhalter met a Roman Catholic bishop in South America who was overseeing a drastically poor diocese with one of the highest rates of HIV in the world. And yet he served and he advocated for so many people and he did it with peacefulness and he did it with joy. And she noticed that. And then she met Becky, an HIV AIDS doctor, an evangelical Christian who met people where they were in life without judgment and insisted that the church be what she called a no penalty zone where people can lay down their defenses, where they can say what they're afraid of, and they can receive the love of God, even if they've made some terrible mistakes. By the way, don't let anybody hijack the name evangelical, as much of our media and political people have done. Um, yes, there are some people that misrepresent what it means to be an evangelical Christian. All the more reason for those who live by the good news of God and that's simply what an evangelical is, someone who lives by the good news of God to demonstrate what that truly means. Doing justice, loving mercy, walking humbly with God, not walking arrogantly with God, walking humbly with God. It's all the more reason. We don't play to political power. We faithfully show lives that show Jesus to an increasingly skeptical and searching world. That's what we do. Little aside there, but Burkhalter came into contact with these evangelical Christians and different people, and her defenses against God began to crumble. It got worse when she was deeply influenced by a very conservative Christian friend, and Holly Burkhalter makes no apologies about being liberal. And this friend said, you know what, you should start praying, which is quite a thing to say to an atheist, isn't it? Well, you know what, Burkhalter started to pray. Holly Burkhalter became a Christian when she applied for a job as a lawyer with International Justice Mission, and she had to write a statement of faith because the organization is Christian and they only hire Christians. And she basically realized that she had come to believe in the good God. She said, I was not a Christian for most of my adult life, precisely because I didn't see evidence that God cared enough about the world to intervene, to save the tortured and the maimed and the insane and the abused. But one of the most important things that got me over the hurdle was observing people who show up to help widows and children and prisoners. God works through these people who love and serve him, and he gives them strength and courage. That made sense to me. Folks, don't ever underestimate the power of a life that lives consistent with the Lord Jesus Christ, and what it says to other people. Well, Holly Burkhalter also tasted that God is good when she prayed. She did begin to pray, and she asked God to become more peaceful and more joyful and more patient, and she doesn't understand it. It's a mystery to her, but she said it started to happen. The more she prayed, the more she changed. Burkhalter confesses, 
She can still sway between doubt and faith, but she can't help but believe that God's hand is in this world as lousy as it can be, that the bad isn't because of God. It's because of people and what they do, or sadly, sometimes what they don't do. As Jesus said to that young man, no one is good but God alone. And through seeing some of the hardest things in the world, Holly came to believe that God is good. Psalm 145 says, the Lord is good to all. Holly Burkhalter says, this glorious expression of God's love and faith being the source of everything that is good shames the smallness in my understanding of God and my contempt for what I had understood to be the God of the Old Testament. The Lord who upholds all that fall and raises up those who are bowed down is a radically generous God available to everybody. She'd come to believe that God's love and care can be present in the most hopeless of circumstances, and she had seen plenty of that. Let me tell you another story of a person who knew that God was good amidst the worst. Alan Gardner was a missionary who experienced many physical difficulties and hardships throughout his service to the Lord Jesus Christ. And despite his troubles, he said, while God gives me strength, failure will not daunt me. And in 1851, at the age of 57, Gardner died. He died of disease and starvation while he was serving on the Picton Islands, which is just at the southern tip of South America. And when his body was found, his diary lay nearby. And it was a diary. It was a record of hunger and thirst and, and loneliness and wounds. And the last entry in that diary, shown with a shaking hand, which he struggled to write legibly, it says this, I am overwhelmed with a sense of the goodness of God. I am overwhelmed with a sense of the goodness of God. David wrote Psalm 34 to invite all who taste God to experience the goodness for themselves. And the crazy and mysterious thing about the goodness of God is his goodness might be tasted more poignantly in our fears, troubles, and sufferings than in our easy and blissful times. It's okay to ask why there's so much bad in the world. We all do. We also have to ask, why is there so much good? Why are so many people doing so many good things in some of the worst and wretched places in the world, whether that be in refugee camps that are far away or maybe even a single home in our own neighborhood? Why are so many people in organizations feeding and healing and praying and encouraging and teaching and, and, and helping in some of the darkest places? And why do that in the name of God, who is good? Why keep doing it? Could it be that God is good and he shares his goodness through his people, that people have tasted his goodness and they can't help but share it? Why did God come in Jesus Christ to this dismal, dark world? You know why? Because God is good. He created us because he is good. Do we think we deserve to exist? Why, does this, why is this world not blown up yet and destroyed itself? Because in his goodness, he spares and saves us. Why would the Son of God come and bleed and die on a cross for me? Why not blame me? Why not condemn me? Why not punish me? Because God is good. Why does God answer prayer? I don't think it's because we're good. It's because he's good. And the thing about the taste of something really good, you never forget it, and you tell others about it. You share the goodness. Jesus' goodness is shown through his people, and he asks us to show his goodness to those who are sick or poor, lonely, in prison. And we're told to remember those going through the worst of it and to do good. Have you tasted the goodness of God in your life? In your family, in the joy that he provides for you, in your wealth, in, in, in all you get to experience, uh, in the peace and the joy you know, in this church, do you taste the goodness of God? 
in the fact that he gave us the strength and the breath and the safety just to come to this place today. In friends, those who care for you, in the modern conveniences we enjoy, in leisure, even in the challenges, even in the challenges. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Indeed. Indeed. So see how many ways you can find the goodness of God this week. Just try it. Make it a spiritual exercise. And see how you can let the goodness of God flow through you to others. Let's pray. Open our eyes, O oh God, by your Holy Spirit, to your goodness. Inspire us to share what we've tasted. Drive us to show good where there has been bad. And we can't do this of our own, so we ask for your grace to do this in us. And then we'll give you all the praise and all the glory. Amen.